I would like to turn off, uh, turn the uh, seminar over to Chris Santino. We'll talk about tissue regeneration. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Well, first, I'd like to thank uh, Robin and the Vatican Council for inviting me. Uh, second, my mom always wanted a priest out of one of her six sons. Uh, she never got the priest. Um, However, uh, this, this might help a little bit, so she's here today. <laughs> so, uh, I'd like to talk to you about adult stem cells for knee arthritis. Now, this type of presentation is a little bit different in that we'll be looking at the whole presentation and zooming in to various parts. Uh, you may need a little Dramamine before we're all done. But <laughs> This is uh, the totality of my presentation, where I'm, where I'm from, how big a problem is knee arthritis, where do we harvest stem cells, uh, what do we do to the stem cells in the lab, how do we get them back into the patient, what are the results, and then some conclusions. So let's start with, with where I'm from. Uh, I actually, obviously, as you can probably tell based on my American English, uh, are, are from here. And uh, my clinic is in Colorado. Uh, we also have uh, sites in uh, the US, other sites that we license to, China and South America. So not just Colorado. So how big a problem is, is knee arthritis? Let's, let's focus in on that piece right now. Well, it's a very, very big problem in the U.S., certainly, I'm sure it's the same elsewhere. Uh, if you have a normal, healthy weight, you have about, you have about a third, uh, one-third chance of getting arthritis. Uh, if you're overweight, slightly more. If you're obese, uh, almost half will get arthritis. So a very big societal problem. Uh, women tend to get more arthritis than men, uh, and uh, not two to one, but significantly more. So we've got a very big problem, and if you look at the U.S., uh, just in this one year, 2005, there were over 500,000 knee replacement surgeries that cost the United States about $11 billion. So a lot of money, a lot of surgery going on. And if we look at uh, just the elderly population in the U.S., uh, that, those number of surgeries roughly doubled between 2000 and 2008. And in 2008, uh, just in the Medicare population, so again, just the elderly, there were 17,500 serious complications, and 5,000 of those were the ultimate life-changing complication, death due to surgery. So this is not just sort of going into uh, the body shop to get a piece replaced, it, it does have serious consequences if it doesn't go uh, the right way. So there's certainly an opportunity, if it's possible, to replace this uh, type of technology. So where do we harvest stem cells? There are many places, as you've heard today, that you can get stem cells. You can get stem cells from adipose tissue, you can get them from almost every tissue in the body. Uh, one of the places where we derive them for our purpose is bone marrow. And you've probably heard a little bit about that today. Uh, it's back in here at what's called the PSIS, uh, the dimples of venous at the back of the hip, where we get those cells. And if we zoom in on that area, the procedure looks something like this. Uh, a patient comes in, we prep the patient, uh, we place basically what looks like a thick needle called a trocar into the area that goes through the bone. Most people think of bone like cement. It's really more like hard plastic. You can actually work something through it. And we then dry out uh, a fluid, or what looks like thick blood. And within that thick blood lives mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, they look a little bit like this. This is sort of a colorized electron micrograph of what they look like. So that's where we get our stem cells and uh, those cells, once we have them now, for the purposes of this, there are other types of treatments we perform, 
then go off to the lab. So what happens to those cells in the lab? Well, the first thing we start with, as you probably heard a little bit about this morning, is we centrifuge those uh, to get out the stem cell fraction. So there are lots of uh, cells in that fraction, and a centrifuge looks something like that. This, the fraction that has the stem cells is called the Buffy coat. Uh, and then that's placed in, into some specialized plastic flasks. So this is sort of a diagram of what that looks like. You've got bone marrow uh, cells in there, and you've got stem cells uh, in there. You then, or we then, incubate those. And an incubator, as you've heard, is nothing more than a place that replicates the growing conditions of the body. So an incubator looks something like that. The cells go inside there. The cells we want are called MSCs, or mesenchymal stem cells. They'll stick to the plastic flask, whereas the other cells won't. They'll just float around. So that gives us a way to separate these out. So you have non-adherent cells that float around in the plastic flask. You've got the mesenchymal stem cells that adhere to the bottom of the flask. So now you've got a way, again, to separate those two. When all of the MSCs have attached to the plastic, you simply pour off the cells you don't want, and the cells you do want are now sticking to the plastic flask. We then detach the MSCs to collect a purified population. So you can take the MSCs that have attached to the flask, you can add a common enzyme, trypsin, to get those off, and then pour out the ones you do want. And all of this is repeated as the cells grow to greater and greater numbers. So that's called culture expansion. And we culture the cells in this particular uh, instance for about two weeks. And that allows us to get about 1,000 times more cells than we started with. Once we have enough cells, we place those into a syringe. So what you're going to see today is an injection-based procedure. So no surgery is involved. Uh, and that's what I think the big uh, advantages of biologic therapies is the ability to get away from some of the more invasive surgeries for some of these conditions and actually move towards needle-based therapies. So that's, how, that's generally what it all looks like, in the lab at least. And now look, let's look at how they go back into the patient. So again, this is an injection rather than surgery. And if we start with a knee, the first thing that we'll do is to place the cells into a specialized device that we've created to keep the cells in suspension. So the goal is to keep them in suspension with this very specialized device. Uh, we then inject the cells only via imaging guidance. That could be either fluoroscopy, which is real-time x-ray, or musculoskeletal ultrasound, depending on where they're going and why we're placing them. And for instance, for the knee, the patient would be positioned like this. Uh, this red arrow is the direction of the needle. The cells we want to implant here on the femoral condyle. The patient is left like that for about 15 minutes or so while the cells attach to that area. So uh, pretty, pretty simple as far as getting the cells back in. And let's take a, a look at what the results are, at least for this particular technique. Uh, these are all of our patients treated with stem cells. You can see uh, uh, two-thirds or so need a knee replacement, about one-third just had a smaller problem. So a fairly severe group of patients. Uh, over the first one to two years after stem cell injections, only a handful, the six of the 155 patients, opted for a knee replacement, despite two-thirds being a knee replacement uh, prospect when we started this. And this is an example of the type of cartilage repair that you can see. Now, let me explain this picture. If you don't look at MRIs all day, it may be difficult to understand. But in the before images up here, which are across the top, uh, the bone is this dark color. The cartilage is this very light gray. And the hole in the cartilage is this dark area. So you can see another slice of the dark area here at the red arrow. And then down in here, you can see in the after picture, a much smaller dark area. 
So this is a good example of the type of thing that we can see. This patient is almost five years out now, still doing very well. She skipped the knee replacement, had a single injection rather than the knee replacement. And if we look at a larger number of patients, uh, and we have much, much more data than this, but I want to keep this uh, at, at a very basic level. Uh, if we look at zero to 100% relief at the one year mark, and we compare those treated with knee stem cells versus untreated, uh, a big difference in those two groups. So I will wrap it up and get to some conclusions. Uh, this is a promising investigational therapy for knee arthritis. There's still more work that needs to be done. Uh, as with most of the therapies we as physicians deliver, uh, even the ones we currently deliver, there's more work to be done. Uh, but again, I think it has the potential to allow patients who need uh, knee replacements, hip replacements, to avoid those, at least some of those patients, by getting an injection of their own stem cells rather than having to undergo these more invasive procedures. So I'll then move to questions. Thank you. So uh, uh, question, yes, in the back there. Don't forget to push your button. There you go. Uh, great presentation, thank you for that. Um, these mesenchymal kind of stem cells that you're using, I know for the trial each potential, one of them being chondrocytes. So we've heard a lot of information here about the paracrine effects of these cells. Is this one of the rare instances where they actually undergo transdifferentiation and replace the damaged cartilage? Do you have any evidence that that's what they're doing? It's a good, it's a very good, where's your phone? Oh, can I push it again? Sorry. Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, there are literally about 500 published studies right now on mesenchymal stem cells and cartilage repair. And not even those 500 studies, I think, have answered that question definitively. I would say that there's probably a little bit of both in this instance. There's probably paracrine effect. There's probably some differentiation. Uh, the upside and the downside of this is it's an autologous therapy. And one of the problems of using your own cells is that it's not like a drug meaning that this is a drug that's only as good as the patient it was taken from. So I suspect in some patients you would see more differentiation and others more paracrine effect. Question? Yes. Excellent presentation, Chris. Um, I'm right over here. Oh, there you go. I have two questions for you. One of them is do you leave the synovial fluid in the knee when you reimplant the cells? And then the second one is how you go about maintaining that the cells stay in place. Uh, very good. Uh, two very good questions. Um, we do leave the stomach fluid in place uh, in the knee. Now, there are times when we'll see patients with very blown up knees uh, that have 100 cc's of, of swelling. And in that case, more because of mechanistic issues, we'll, we'll take some of that out. Uh, and when we try to culture that, interestingly enough, it, it only has... Uh, inflammatory cells, or a high number of inflammatory cells. Uh, that then brings us to the second question, and we use a machine that keeps the cells in suspension, and the cells are literally dripped onto the lesion. Uh, we have some animal data that shows that the cells will attach to the lesion, and if you do it that way, you get better cartilage repair than if you just inject the cells someplace in the vicinity of the intraarticular uh, knee space. So uh, we actually attach the cells to uh, the lesion, and we'll get about 60 to 80 percent based at least on the animal data that's attached. Yes. Bob. <coughs> Chris, do you know of any data uh, to start with looking at the difference between either the source of the MSC that you get, because they can come from many different tissues, uh, and whether that be allogeneic or autologous as well? Any data that would say that there's any difference in the effect that you would see in? repairing the osteochondral defect? Uh, excellent question. Uh, so let me break that down into two categories, the first being uh, allogeneic and autologous. Right now, there isn't necessarily a head-to-head -head study of which I'm aware, uh, but there is some data that would suggest, at least in cartilage repair, and this may be different for everything else we're talking about, uh, 
uh, allogeneic cells may be taken out by the, by the killer T system as they differentiate. Um, so you may be relying more on the paracrine effect of those cells in cartilage repair. Uh, now, when we move sort of to just autologous, there is a, a pretty stark difference between uh, cells of different sources. So regrettably, this is one of those cases where adipose cells are, are wonderful for uh, some of the things we've heard about today, uh, vascular, but not as good, regrettably, for cartilage repair when compared to bone marrow cells. Uh, actually, synovial uh, derived MSCs are uh, even slightly better than bone marrow cells. So uh, source does seem to make a difference. And if you look at some of the source studies, what's interesting is the closer you get to the, the site of repair, uh, the better that tissue or that, that stem cell seems to be, uh, just as an observation from what I've read. One more question? And Chris, are, are you, you mentioned knee arthritis. Are you doing it in other other joints and have similar studies and similar results? Uh, we are. We uh, so, so to date, uh, we've treated hip arthritis as well. That's a separate data set that I didn't get in today. Uh, ankle and shoulder rotator cuff repairs. Uh, so we. I've certainly done it in other areas, uh, only within the field of orthopedics, though not outside of that. All right, well, thank you very much.